John chapter 15. The world continues to ask in in anyone's heart, uh, if they're honest, has asked, who is the baby Jesus? Most men over all the earth and down through the years have said that Jesus is a prophet, a good teacher. But Jesus asks all men, who do you say that I am? And Jesus answers, I am the bread, uh, I am the light. I am the resurrection and the life, and uh, now today, uh, the vine. And then next week, on Christmas Day, John chapter 10, uh, the gate, I am the gate, and I am the shepherd. And then on January 1st, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what a great passage to begin our new year. John chapter 15, even though that's where it begins, I'm the true vine, but I just want to remind us of John chapter 14, the very last verse. Um, We believe that the context is carrying over from John chapter 13, which is in the upper room where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, and now it's time to leave the upper room. John chapter 14, the very last verse, verse 31 says, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. I think what Jesus has done, which is typical of him, Uh, throughout his entire gospel ministry is that he used the things of the earth and used many things in society, uh, agricultural, money, um, lots of things to describe and to teach who he is. And I think what he has done is just that he's walked his disciples out of the upper room in in, uh, downtown Jerusalem and has walked them outside uh, and now they are strolling through a wine vineyard. And he says, I am the true vine. There is a family member, because of my dad's death, there is a family member. Uh, She is in her 70s, and she is resolved to discover even more and more about the Truman family. She, lit, she texted me and Facebooked me this week, and um, she wants me to write some stories of my dad, and she's putting together a book. Uh, she wants all the names and birth dates of my family, and she wants me to write a few stories of my dad's life. She's putting together a Truman book. Um, What should I put in there? All the good stuff about my dad's life or all the bad stuff that I know? Here, how about this story? I mean, that's what the Lord told Matthew to write about Jesus' genealogy. How many of you ever put together a resume, a real resume, and submitted it? A real resume. What'd you put in there? Your successes or your failures? I thought for sure that I would not make it into college. In fact, I was making sure that no college would ever accept me. I didn't want to go to college. And my senior year of high school, when it was time to go up to Nicholas County High School on a Saturday morning and take our SAT, me, Ronnie Jr. Truman, Rod Truman, we sat there, we don't want to go to college and we're going to make sure right now. We took out our number two pencils, and I'll never forget it, 1980. 
instructions given. We looked at each other. <laughs> We're not going to college. Took us five minutes to take the SAT. We just went like this and just filled in every single circle. Didn't even read them. Put our pencils down, looked at each other, grinned, and went, <laughs> we're not going to college. <laughs> and slept the rest of the Saturday morning. Ronnie Jr. went in the Air Force. That's what happens. That's the kind of people that the Air Force will take. <laughs> Ronnie Jr. went in the Air Force. <laughs> Rod went in the Marines. Any Marines in here? And Scott, the younger brother, went in the Army. But Scott made 4.0s. I mean, he just. I didn't want to go. In fact, I wanted on my resume failure because I don't want to succeed. Not at this. The strange thing going through life is that when you want to su succeed at some things and you try really hard and you fail, and then the weird thing happens is that you wanted to fail, and I ended up in college anyway because Tennessee Temple accepted morons from West Virginia. <laughs> I ended up in college, and then God changed my heart and made me a lover of words and books. If you look in your past or if you think your past isn't ugly enough, look deeper. Look further back. Do you realize there's really nothing worthy to be on your resume if you submit your resume to God? Now submit your resume. Because he knows everything. 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 There are times when in my own life when I discovered the reputation of my last name, Truman, I really wished, I, I used to dream and fantasize that when I used to start studying who Harry S. Truman was, is that surely there's got to be a bank account somewhere with my name on it, left over from Grandpa Truman. Have you ever wondered, I wish my last name was Hilton? Maybe not Paris Hilton, but at least Hilton. Then I would be rich. I would be famous. I would be powerful. I would be on the inside group. I would be up the ladder in the penthouse on top of the world. If only I was connected to fill in the blank. Then I could get that job. I could get into that school. I could get that pay raise. I could get hired there. I could... When Jesus said that he was the true vine, it reminded the disciples, you're not. And you will never qualify. Your resume is hideous. But not mine. And that language, I am the true vine, my resume will stand before my father for over 700 years. Failure, failure, failure. And if that wasn't enough, the reason why Matthew started at the very beginning was that even before Isaiah, failure, 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 failure. And your only hope is to be connected to someone who's sinless and perfect, the true vine. It's not enough that my dad was a pastor. I can't go to God and say, let me in because my dad was a faithful pastor. I can't. Because God knows what kind of man my dad was before he was a pastor. 
And God knows what kind of a man my dad would have been had not God not poured grace into his life and then let him down that life. God knows what you are in your past and God knows what you would have been had it not been for his grace. Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the only true human whose resume is not sullied by his family, but rather causes those who are connected to him to be cleansed of their sin, and therefore, by faith in Jesus Christ, your resume is white as snow. That's the Christmas message. And so the hope of Christmas is not, you too can be a better person if you try, but the hope of Christmas is though you have failed, you too can be in union with the best person of all. And now I've used the word union because that's what's going on here. The text says, chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch, so here's the language of connection, of union. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be may be full. I want to share just three quick things with you. Number one, the vine dresser's twofold work on the vine is this. Clearly, in the first part, every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he, the vine dresser, God the Father, takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. God the Father is the vine dresser's twofold work. He removes false branches False branches like, and Jesus will speak of it, like Judas Iscariot, like those in John chapter 6 that just wanted the free lunch, and then the text says in John, John 6 verse 66 that they left. They just walked away from him. People who like to use Jesus language, Christian language, go to church once in a while, whatever, and but they're gone. And that's God the Father's way of removing dead branches, not true branches. They're not producing the fruit, the life of Christ. He takes them away. And he also knows who the true branches are and he prunes them, clips them back severely, disciplines them that they may bear more fruit. It's the vine dresser's twofold work on the vine. And he does this to cultivate the family, the true family, the true branches, those who are connected to the true vine. I'm thankful that I get to look out uh, on you and those who aren't here as well, many who aren't here in this church family, and I can see how the vine dresser and the years have gone by, and they're still going by, and I can see real evidence of the vine dresser's work on you. Not Pastor Ivan's work, the vine dresser's work. I can't do this. I'm, my resume is bad. It's a, it's a failure. I cannot produce this. Israel had 700 years from the time of Isaiah to produce real fruit, and they failed. Who do I think I am? So who's behind this growth in your life, little by little over the years? It is God the Father. He is pruning. And it hurts. And I've seen you hurt. And then I've looked at my own life and I see God the Father working and it hurts. 
but yet it produces the life of Christ, and that's the fruit. Secondly, this text teaches that the vine dresser's assurance of salvation for true branches. The vine dresser's assurance of salvation for true branches. In other words, when Jesus says, As if you abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove. There is the assurance, there is the evidence, the proof to be, proved to be my disciples. Well, the fruit is simply the life of Christ. If the branch is attached to the vine and Jesus is the vine, then what ought to be flowing out is, the fruit is, and I don't think this is a reference to how Paul summed it up, the fruit of the Spirit. I just simply means, just stick with the metaphor, it's the life of Christ. And of course it means the fruit of the Spirit, but it's the life of Christ. In other words, there is the aroma of Christ on your life. You look like, you act like, you enjoy Christ, you want to be near him, you want to hear his word, you want to fellowship with those who also love Jesus. It's the life of Christ. You and I cannot manufacture the life of Christ. The only explanation as to why anyone wants to be near Jesus and wants to be near those who also love Jesus is because of the vine dresser's work is proving to you that you are the real deal. You're a true branch. And if you see that in your life, and if you see that in the life of others, it's proof that, that the vine dresser is at work. James isn't here this morning, and James gave, and if you were here uh, on the 11th and, and listened to James give his testimony, and the others as well, Adrian and Tom, but James's testimony sticks out in my mind because of, I remember the day that I picked him up at the Kendall County Sheriff's Department. And I got the call from the sheriff. Okay. This is going to turn out to be a, a dry run. You know, my, my skepticism. I can't, I'm going over here to pick up a 21-year-old kid. And I was told why he got arrested and why he served time 30 days at the Kendall County Jail. And I remember driving up. And there's James with a duffel bag. And he's sitting there like this in the duffel bag he's just like this and I drove up and I said oh man what a loser I actually thought that what a loser and I go, I'm going to pick him up and take him to Wayside I was thinking that and praying at the same time because I get tired there's that sinful fleshly side of me I hate investment that doesn't turn out to produce fruit I'll, I'll stop right there. I wonder how God feels. You're talking about someone who has invested. And the whole world can't get past Silver Bells and Andy Williams and Frank Sinatra. That's as far as they can get. And yet the blood has been shed. Aren't you glad that you have seen the evidence of the vine dresser in James' life? <laughs> Who could have pulled that off but the vine dresser alone? <laughs> no one, I could, none of us could have pulled that off. No Celebrate Recovery program could have ever pulled that off. It's the vine dresser. And this is the assurance, the real, the real deal. The life of Christ is surely and slowly coming to blossom in your life. And this is what you pray for. This is why Jesus said, you may ask whatever you will and it will be done to you. That doesn't mean that you'll get what you want next Sunday. In the context, you'll get whatever is needed to produce the life of Christ. Now, rearrange your prayers. And you'll know the joy of of Jesus. Thirdly, the vine dresser already saved you with the words of his son. This is a strange, um, looks like a, a, um, uh, a misstep on Jesus' part, a misstep in, in using a metaphor, but he says in verse 3, already you are clean. I mean, he's, he, we're standing in the midst of a, of a wine vineyard, and we're talking about clusters of grapes and a vine and branches, and then he says, already you are clean. 
because of the word, verse 3, that I have spoken to you. And what's helpful here is, uh, well, thank God for Greek. Someone's got to learn it. The word here for clean and the word for prune are nearly identical. But you can't see it. Not reading English. And the metaphor really works. Because have you ever moved through um, something that you're harvesting, some kind of plant, and you are cleaning the plant of the debris of the dead branches? And the, you're cleaning it up. And that's what Jesus means here. Not cleaning in like washing, but cleaning in the sense of getting rid of that which hinders growth. He's cleaning up the vine. Of course, it harkens back to chapter 13 when Jesus washes the disciples' feet and Peter objects, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus responds, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. The point is, is like there and like here in chapter 15, there is no union with Christ unless Christ makes the connection with you because your ability to connect with Jesus through your resume and what you have to offer is not possible. All you've got is failure. All Jesus have, has is, is success. Of course, Peter responds, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus says, uh, the one who has bathed does not need to be totally cleaned or washed except for his feet. And here, likewise, in chapter 15, the metaphor is consistent. He says here already, verse 3, he says, already you are clean. The same thing he said in chapter 13. You're already clean. You don't need to be clean. You're already clean. You don't need to be pruned. You're already pruned. But you do need the sanctification. You need the daily pruning. You need the daily cleans cleansing. The judgment is already done. You have passed from death to life. You'll never come into judgment. You have already been cleaned. You've already been pruned. You're on the other side of judgment. You will never be cut off from the vine and burned. However, those who prove to be, because they never really were attached to Jesus, like Judas Iscariot, will be taken away. And then he says, abide in me. Um, that's an imperative. It's a command. It's not negotiable. And how do we do that? Well, we are reminded that we are already in the vine. You've already been pruned. Now, keep living that way. In other words, prove that you are a true disciple, that you are a true believer, that you are a true branch by submitting to the pruning and the cleansing. And the point of verse 3 is do it because you are already, you're already cleansed. You're already pruned. You are already a disciple. So be a disciple of Jesus on the basis of what? Because you already are one. And it was the vine dresser who did that. You're already united to him. Um... I wonder how many of you have something like this in your house. If not, at least one, maybe more. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you what it is. Are you ready, Bonnie? I'll bet you've got dozens of these. Are you ready? Here we go. Anybody got one of these in your house? An unfilled... <laughs> It's a photo album just waiting for you to get around to the next project of, of putting pictures in it. And there it sets, maybe two or three of them. Anybody got a photo album, a brand new photo album in their house, and there's no pictures in it? Just sits there. Anyone? Are we the only ones? We got dozens of these. I told Cheryl, I said, by the time you get that stuff in there, we're going to be so old with cataracts, we're going to be blind, and we won't be able to see them anyway. So what's the point? Because eventually, even if you don't go blind in this life, you're going to die, and this photo album just sits there. 
I started thinking about this text some time ago and thinking about uh, our lives, my life, your life, uh, the failures in our lives. And literally, I kid you not, I'm going to run with this, just thinking about this text and almost couldn't go to sleep last night. The Lord woke me up at, it was two or three o'clock in the morning. And I, I, I woke up and I've got this message on my mind. And I've got ideas of how I want to end this sermon. I've got them written down. And I kid you not, this is what the Lord gave to me. And now we're going to find out that was the Lord for it was just that bad food. This is what a life is without Jesus. You don't have a life. Not really. Nothing's going to stick forever. Nothing's going to last. Without me, you can do... That doesn't mean you can't tie your shoes or get a job or take a test and do well on it and help somebody out this Christmas season who doesn't know the Lord and give sacrificially. That's not what that means in terms of nothing. What it means is this. You can't do anything to get yourself connected to the vine nor do anything to ultimately present a nice, pretty resume in front of God in the sense of, if you look down through your life and look at the pictures and look, look at the successes, and I've got pictures of my graduation, my Master of Divinity. I've got pictures of getting married. I've got pictures of my children born and grandchildren born. I've got pictures of me at age 20. How old was I? I was 25 years old in Alabama because we lived in Chattanooga. I entered a 100 mile race called a century because I was in uh, competition in those days. Uh, racing, bicycle racing. And I entered a race. And uh, I finished that race, a 100-mile race, in five hours and 26 minutes. I was smoking. I weighed 136 pounds, nothing but ripped. 136 pounds, no fat at all in me, muscle, muscle, muscle. Got pictures of that and the placement that I came in. But without Jesus, even though you think you're piling up great memories and a great resume to present to God one day, without Jesus, this is my life. This is Jimmy Stewart's life. <laughs> without Jesus, there's nothing to brag about, there are no photo ops. There's nothing without Christ. And that made me think, you know what? I'm going to make this now prominent. Because this was, you've got a bunch of these up in the closet. And I'm going to make this prominent. It, it's really helping me to remind myself that if it were not for Jesus, I would have no union, no connection, no bragging rights. In fact, now my bragging rights and all my boasting is in Christ. Because without him, I, I've, I've got nothing. And I am nothing without him. But with him, all of a sudden, now I can spend forever talking about memories, bicycle races, time with you, time with my family, college, seminary, good successes, marriage, because it really is all because of Christ. Everything, everything is because of Christ. I've got nothing without him. And neither do you. And I hope you see that. That Jesus is the true vine. And you're not. And you will never be that. But you can have a wonderful resume. A wonderful portfolio. A wonderful life. And in the hereafter. If you are abiding in Christ. And producing that life. And I'm so thankful for this fact. 
The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And this is what happens if you don't have Christ. He will come and he will steal and kill and destroy. And on judgment day, you've got nothing. But I have come, says Jesus, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And now there's an eternity of enjoying all the good work of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have nothing to offer you, but you have everything to offer us. We, like Abraham and all the way throughout the years, throughout the genealogies, uh, all we've got is failure to offer you, and all you have is success. We have no connections to you. You are the one who makes a connection to us. We have no union with you. You are the one who has brought us into union with you. We have no life without you. You are the one who has brought us life. We've got nothing without you, Lord. And you have everything, and you've given it to us. This is why you came as a baby. This is the message of Christmas. This is the hope that we have in you. And Lord, there are a lot of our broken hearts <coughs> revealed at this time of the year. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would, would help us to, re, or at least remind us of what we have in you so that we may share that with others. Maybe just to go and, and go, if we don't have one, go buy an, a photo album and walk up to someone that we love and that we care about that doesn't know Christ and say, hi, I want you to have this. Because this is what my life is like without Jesus. It's empty. It's empty. So Lord, thank you for giving us everything. Everything. In Christ's name we pray.